Uh, great. So uh, thanks for having me, uh, Eric. So Eric is one of my favorite former colleagues um, at Wharton, and this initiative is sort of one of my favorite initiatives. And it's because it speaks to the core of the things that like I really like to do, which is learn from data to help decisions, um, help businesses make really good decisions. Um, so the font looks a little funny here. Hopefully the slides will be okay. But hopefully you can see that this is about research and TV. Right, so show of hands, how many of you guys watch TV? <laughs> awesome. You will not believe that when I give talks like this to academic audiences, there are times when nobody raises their hands, okay? So studying television um, to some people seems like a very lowbrow thing to do, but because so many of us do it, and because companies like you want to understand how people respond to TV advertising, um, it's a fascinating place to look at the interactions between television viewership and what people are doing online, right? And what's cool about this space is that for a very long time, audiences were measured in one specific way, right? You had set-top boxes that were being tracked and people would have to say, like, yes, it's me watching um, a particular television show and then uh, companies like you would get some report to say, you know, people of a certain demographic were watching or weren't watching, and this is how many were watching. But now we have, one, the opportunity to use other types of data to begin to understand audiences. And also, the way we watch television has changed a little bit, right? Um, so we're not always watching linear television, meaning like watching the show when it first airs all at the same time. Um, and also, the data that we get from TV is, is more precise in terms of knowing who's watching, and also um, it, it has a lot of data connected to it. So I'm going to talk really about one um, area that I've been focused on since joining Mar Microsoft. I've, I joined two years ago, and when I first got there, I sort of looked around to figure out all of the ways I could study TV, because that was my thing. And I talked to a lot of people for six months, and I talked to Xbox, right? So we just heard about gaming, because people watch a lot of TV on Xbox, right? So that was kind of the obvious place, looking for entertainment. But there ended up being another obvious place, and I, I kind of alluded to it earlier. We are a huge advertiser. So Microsoft is a huge advertiser. In fact, we spend not millions, but billions of dollars on advertising. And I figured it probably would make sense to help the company be a little bit more efficient, or at least try to be a little bit more efficient at advertising, and therefore sort of measuring it to be more efficient to optimize it. Um, so this is just a, a list of ways that when asked uh, via a simul media study, um, when brand advertisers were asked how do they measure um, advertisement, these are the sort of top five ways that um, large brand advertisers answered. So the first way is they basically base a lot of their results on survey data that asks customers about their purchase intent and brand awareness and how likely they are to recommend the product to a friend. Now, I'm not criticizing these strategies, however, there are possible ways that we can complement this data with real-time interactions with television, right? So usually these, these surveys are, are asked to people uh, usually in a cadence of about a week, so weekly. Um, and they're incomplete because it, it causes people to recall um, what, they've, what they've watched. Did they see an ad? If so, um, how did they feel about it? And it's incomplete because we don't often have other data besides that tied to those users. Um, oftentimes, uh, advertisers will correlate sales data with these type of data or ad spend, so the survey data or ad spend. Um, they might get really smart and put a unique URL in an ad or um, on a digital ad even, and so then you can track users. And then oftentimes, you'll have attribution models that are either purchased from third parties or built internally. And Sometimes even we look at marketing mixed models. So these are pretty standard, and for those of you in marketing, probably sound pretty familiar. And I'm not suggesting that any of these are bad, but just instead that because we have new data, maybe we can begin to understand how people are responding to advertising a little bit differently. Um, so 
I can't put every single type of data we have on our customers on a slide, but we have a lot of it. And by our customers, I mean at Microsoft, right? So we're a large company and people interact with our technologies and um, people have been talking about the exhaust. A lot of exhaust gets created as a result. And so I really love putting together data sets that people haven't been put together before. And when I got there, I was like, how can I use all this data that's just sitting around as part of our regular business processes to understand how people respond to television? Um, so what I do is I link advertising data, so TV ad data specifically, to what people do online, as I alluded to earlier. And specifically, I want marketers to think about not just how to measure television advertising, but because you can observe their digital behaviors, how to think about coordinating efforts across channels. Oftentimes, you'll have one person responsible for TV ads, one person responsible for digital, another person respons responsible for sponsored search. And they talk, but they don't really coordinate their efforts. So we could begin to figure out what people are doing, and then based on that, make suggestions for how people should advertise. So um, the first campaign that I analyzed as part of my research, so I'm still a researcher. I'm not a product person. Um, this is part of a research study that we started. We analyzed um, Windows 10. Um, and it was a large campaign. It was beautiful from a, a data perspective because we spent a lot of money on it. We spent a lot of money globally, and almost everybody wanted it, right? I mean, a lot of people downloaded it at least, right? So it gave us the opportunity to really look across geographies and different types of users. And because of the scale, we weren't missing data anywhere, right? Like just a lot of people were responding. So it was this beautiful example where, I don't know if there's a point, we can link the TV ad, so when an ad was shown and where. And that little box in the middle is what you would see if you, if you go to Bing. And so I just typed in 110 in the box. And the big picture uh, to the right is just what you would see when I type this in if you were looking on a desktop versus at the bottom what you would see if you were looking on a mobile device, right? So we can see in the minutes after an ad whether somebody searched just at a very high level. You know, I know an ad was shown at 5 p.m. How many searches were there at 5.01 p.m., right? Um, and then what people did on the page. Did they click on an ad? Did they click on an organic link? Did they do nothing? So the data that we try to connect or connect in these studies our TV ad data, so this is very aggregate data still. It's an ad was shown nationally at a particular time on a particular show, on a particular network, um, and we have some estimate uh, from a third party company. So first we were working with Competitrack data, now we work with iSpot TV data. So an estimate of how many um, dollars were spent on the ad. Then for the searches, we filter the searches based on the brand that we're interested in. At least that's what we were doing initially. So for instance, for Win 10, we filtered the searches where we took only the searches that included Win 10 or Windows 10. If we were studying Xbox, we did the same. So the searches that included Xbox. And then we looked at what happened after people searched. So conditioned on those searches. So then we know if they clicked on the ads, where was the ad positioned on the page? And then we get some very high level crude information about the users, what types of devices they're using, um, and some, some demographics. So we connect all that data to try to make a causal claim, and this is really important. So that's why I mentioned earlier, like it's, it's kind of still research. So to make a causal claim between a television advertisement and some behaviors that were taken online. So did a TV ad cause people to search more after the TV ad was shown, right, is what we're, what we're asking. Um, and so how we set this up, because it's still observational data for us. Remember, I like, kind of specialize in taking advantage of all the data that's laying around, not running experiments or anything like that. Um, we try to set the data up, though, still to look as if it came from an experiment, OK? And so what happens is we try to figure out ways to find a reasonable control group for all these people we thought saw the ad. And there's something that happens um, in Canada called simultaneous substitution. 
So what happens is when shows that are aired both in the United States and Canada, um, or aired in Canada, the Canadian government mandates that the ads get substituted with Canadian advertisements. So then for products or brands that are large advertisers that pretty much show up globally, we can treat Canadians, as long as you know, we believe they more or less otherwise uh, look and act like Americans, we can, um, we can treat them as our control group. So the only difference then is that the Canadians didn't see the TV ad, right? So we have all of these little mini experiments going on that we could take advantage of. Now, not all products are gonna be advertised in Canada. An example um, of one that we advertise is we have like something called an NFL game day evolution game, right? And so that NFL is a US-based organization. We weren't advertising it in, uh, in Canada. And so we have other strategies when that is the case. For instance, we can compare what happens in the US when, a, um, when an ad is shown. So let's say again, an ad was shown at 5 p.m. today um, to what happened the week before, right? So as long as it's not like the beginning of a product launch, we can assume the week before is more or less the same. And as, as long as there wasn't an ad also being shown at 5 p.m., then we use that as our control group. So then to make this causal claim, we do two things. We take two differences. What happens right after the ad compared to what happened before, and then we subtract out what happens in this control group. So sometimes the Canadian population and sometimes the week before, okay? And we do this dynamically so that we can see precisely when uh, search spikes in the minutes after the ad. And so this is important because what I argue is that we can get a lot of benefit, not just because there's more data, but because this data is really granular, right? So we can begin to do minute by minute analysis of the data by really fine grained um, locations. So this is just saying that the diff and diff analysis, so differences and differences, allows us to set this up to make causal claims. And then also, maybe more importantly for marketers in the audience, because we can cohort users based on their demographics or behavioral characteristics or devices, um, or even cohort the ads by the characteristics, what type of show were they shown in, um, how much was spent on them, we can begin to look at how differences um, vary by these different cohorts. So are men more likely to respond to a particular ad or women um, or people from a certain type of device? So at a high level in that first study, um, here are the, the results that we found. So the first thing um, is that the search response peaks in just the minutes after the ad. And if we had data that was at the hourly level, right, so that wasn't, it, it wasn't as granular, we might have missed the effect, right? So we see that this effect happens in the minutes after the ad. We see a much stronger response on smartphone devices and tablets. So again, this might not be surprising, but we see it in the data. So people are not bringing their desktops to you know, sit in front of the television. You're sitting in front of the television with your smartphone and, and your tablets, right? And so we can see that because we can look at this granular data. And we can see which demographics are responding more to certain types of ads, both in terms of the creative and which types of shows. And then we also find, and again, this goes back to the coordination story, that people are more likely to click on an ad, a, a sponsored search ad, in the minutes after a TV ad, right? And there are all kinds of reasons why that can be true. Their intent is changing, right? So these are the people that are, they just saw the ad, they're really looking for what you're, you're trying to, to sell them. Um, it could be, you know, a movement to small devices, and I'm not gonna get so much into that, but we try to tease it out. Um, so, we did this study for Windows 10 first, and we were really excited about it because we could see the heterogeneity in response, um, and also, you know, only people, people are only responding on these small devices. And we went to our marketing team and said, hey, isn't this cool? And they were like, hmm, okay, show us on another, another um, product or another uh, campaign. And so what they told us to do is look to see whether when our OEM partners are featured in the Windows 10 campaigns, whether we see search spikes for them as well. And so this is more as like a, a validation in, in general, but we learned something interesting. 
So this time we had more than one ad. So we, we analyzed four campaigns. Some of them featured OEM partners. So one featured Dell and another featured HP. And some of them didn't feature any partners. And we could compare them. And this time, instead of going in just with Windows 10, we went in with uh, features or keywords associated with the OEM partners as well. Um, and so again, we found that there was a peak in the minutes after the ad, so our partners were benefiting. Again, there was a much stronger response on smartphone and tablets. And then we learned something interesting. And I, I, you'll have to tell me later, maybe offline, if you think this is interesting too, but I think it's fascinating. So it turned out in one of, I'm scared to go back, I don't want this to, let's see. Okay, so it turned out that in one of these ads, so in the Doyen ad, um, and you can sort of bing these and, and look for them later. Um, he said, Windows 10 is amazing, right? So it didn't feature another product. In the Beowulf ad, he said, Windows PC is amazing. So initially, we went in with this set of um, topics, like where we had Win 10, Windows 10, and we didn't have Windows PC. And then I was like scratching my head, why is Windows 10 popping up? for the first ad, but not the last one. And then I listened to them, and then we had to go back and look at Windows PC. So it turns out that the scripts of the advertisements actually impact what people search for after them. And again, this is like one of those things that's obvious in hindsight, but if you really want some, somebody to search for something particular, in particular after your TV ad, then you better make sure it's in the script, right? Um, so I thought that was, that was pretty cool. Um, so how does this translate into something real, right? So I'm not really a product person, although I do want um, my research to get into products. So we have um, kind of a prototype that's built that's being used in two ways. One, to help our own marketing team um, basically optimize their campaigns. And really what that means is we're giving them these insights from prior campaigns and then they can see whether, okay, if being in the first position in a pod, for instance, leads to more searches, do we want to spend more money and pay uh, to be first when we, when we buy um, space on, on TV? Um, but then also we're making recommendations for keywords based on what pops up after um, a TV ad, and so this is useful for our sales team. So these are two different ways that, that this research are, are being piloted in the company. So this is kind of our little prototype. You basically put in a date range um, for when your campaign is on, some text patterns. Um, so for instance, if I were looking for a Honda campaign, I could put in Honda. And then what you have to bring to the prototype is your TV airings data, so when and where a TV ad was shown. Um, and then after pulling all of that data from our systems, you get some plots that you can use for, for insights for your campaign. So um, basically what this, this diagram is just showing is that these were the ad spends and airings for a particular Honda ad, so an ad for Honda Ridgeline. And then more importantly, interestingly, and sort of this is getting down to the research, is what we then plot after connecting the TV airings data to search is the number of searches in the minutes before and after that Ridgeline ad that included Honda Ridgeline. So um, in the first upper left-hand corner, on the horizontal axis, you have minutes. So right there in the middle is the time of the ad. And you see that huge bump on tablet and smartphone after the TV ad is shown, just like when we analyzed our own Windows campaign. So this is a campaign for Honda. And then in the bottom right, it's not as easy to see, and sorry about that, but if you, if you could see it closely, a little bit more closely, what you would see is that for this particular campaign, we see a bump for men and not for women. And when I picked this one, I didn't pick it for any other reason other than it was a big campaign. So there was a lot of ad spend, and it turns out that the Honda Ridgeline is a pickup truck, right? When I went back and looked, I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense that there wouldn't be as many female respondents to this particular automobile. Um, what we can also see is on the left top, these are showing the search responses, um, well, the searches for Honda um, in the minutes before ads, so when an ad is not being shown compared to the minutes after. And 
again, it's, I think it's going to be a little hard to see from far away, but what you would see if you could see it is that on the second line, in the minutes after the ad, the Honda Ridge line really jumps up in terms of the things that people um, are searching for in the minutes after the ad, right? Which is exactly what a company would want to see if they cared about um, optimizing for search. So there are other applications besides uh, TV advertising that we can use search data to understand TV viewers. So I'm just gonna go through another one really quickly. So just like um, for TV ads where we know uh, a time that the ad was shown, for shows we also know when they were showed for the, shown for the first time. So this is just an example for Super Bowl. On the horizontal axis it's time. Um, and we have the 24 hours after the Super Bowl, the 24 hours before the Super Bowl, and the time that the Super Bowl was on. And the red um, corresponds to when people were searching for mobile phone, and the blue corresponds to people who were searching from PCs. So what you see again is when people are searching during uh, TV shows, they're really doing that primarily from mobile. Um, and then we can see dynamics in query usage. So if we look at the searches during, before, and after the Super Bowl, we see that there are differences in terms of what people are looking for, and that's probably not surprising. So the bars that um, are, are more green are the things that were searched for before the Super Bowl, so you see things like Super Bowl ticket and um, Carolina Panthers and Super Bowl predictions, so people looking for predictions probably because they're gonna bet on the game in advance of the game. At the end, you see people looking for the Super Bowl MVP and uh, the commercials, right, to revisit the commercials. And again, you know, this makes sense, but you'd have to look at the data. What is surprising, though, is that unlike in this example where it's like, okay, it makes sense that I would search for different things, you might also click for different things. So this is showing that for this query Super Bowl, where people put in exactly Super Bowl, people clicked on different links depending upon where um, they were throughout the day. So they clicked on, for instance, watch live uh, stream online for free during the game a lot more than they would have, or than they did before and after. And so these bars should be, so this is again green 24 hours before, blue during, and yellow 24 hours after. This should be monotonically decreasing if our search engine is perfectly optimized. So anytime where you see bars sticking out, it suggests that perhaps there would have been a different ranking. And we can look at that because we know how the, the, the schedule of the show, and then now we learn how the dynamics um, happen over time. And so we actually built some pretty sophisticated models. These are just topics that pop out when we link the search queries and the clicks that people made after, and the snippets that, that are associated with the pages that people clicked on. And then we associate these topics with temporal, so time, so are they um, predictive of what happened before, during, and after the show? Um, so the results are that we can use television show schedules to predict the dynamics of search intent, um, and again, that we see a much stronger response on TV. Um, I spent some time kind of setting this up and saying that you know we have to, uh, when we're working with observational data, at least when we want to make causal claims, set this data up as if it came from an experiment. Um, and we try to be very careful when we're doing that so that we can make causal claims. And we try to think of clever ways to, um, to sort of organize our data in that way. Um, but I just want to point you to the future if you're not already aware. So right now we're using op aggregate data, observational data, but the future is very near where you're going to be able to advertise to people um, at the individual level household, so addressable TV solutions where you'll be able to directly not only advertise on TV, but coordinate your efforts on digital at the same time. And that will provide opportunities to run real experiments, to begin to measure where your waste is, right, which is what a lot of advertisers and marketers care about, but also where things work really well. And so that's really an exciting um, next step. Also, in the not too distant future, you'll probably see ads that are triggered by voice, right? So you see an ad and you'll say, buy that right away, and it'll trigger um, something on your phone. So 
hopefully I've convinced you that um, one, TV is still exciting. I guess you guys still watch TV, so um, maybe you agree. But more importantly, that like looking at the interactions between when you're watching television and like what you're doing online could be really useful for companies, especially for those that are advertising a lot on television. So I think I'm out of time, and we'll have questions later. Yeah, thank you.